Welcome to Authors Revealed and Becky Anderson. We have two-time Caldecott winning medalist and illustrator Chris Van Alsberg here with the 30th anniversary of the Polar Express. Chris, welcome back to Anderson's in Naperville. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you and what I can't believe that the Polar Express is 30 years old. And I'm sure you're probably saying that to yourself to a certain degree, too. I cannot believe it's been 30 years since the book came out initially. Well, um, I, I believe it. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot has happened since yeah. then. I've written some other books. Oh, um, sure, sure. Uh, and um, I've signed a lot of the Polar Expresses. Any idea? Yeah. Probably no guess. How many that I've yeah. actually put Can my... Can you imagine? Well, there's this old joke that, that people think that the signed book is... Uh, has extra value because it has the author's signature, but yeah. but unsigned Polar Expresses may be uh, rarer than signed ones. I don't know. It's oh, oh. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. Yes, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> but it, tell, tell us now, this book is 30 years old. It's become so iconic. I think, you know, it, it, for my children, and now probably second generation of people are reading it now to their children. Um, it's become that book that you read on Christmas Eve, along with The Night Before Christmas yes, by Clement yeah. Moore. So it's become, th this is a forever Christmas book. Look, shaping up that way. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> no, it's true. So, so tell us a little bit, where, where did the seeds start to grow for this, this story, or the elements of it had come together, you know, based in some of your childhood, those types of things? Well, I, that, that's where the seeds came from, my childhood. I, the, there's a theme in the book, uh, which has to do with getting to a point in your life where you uh, want to believe in something, but, but your, uh, you know, the rationality that's becoming part of your life as you mature and, and you, question, you question the stories you've been told and, and uh, you have to uh, sort of make a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, do I <laughs> want to grow up and forget about all that? Right. Uh, uh, all these things that I've been told. And so, so I had, I'm sure, I can't exactly place the, the exact time, but eight or nine, had those feelings that I, I wonder if all this could be possible because it seems so extraordinary. And by this I mean the remarkable uh, um, visit that Santa right, makes right. to so many houses uh, in one night and, and, and such a big bag of toys and everything. And I, I started to wonder about that and, and um, uh, was conflicted by it. Because yes, I could I, I, I could choose to to doubt it, but uh, the world would be so much less interesting if, if that was the case. Right. And uh -huh. and December wouldn't be the same kind of month it was oh, right, if that right. was the case. So yeah. I, you know, I didn't want to stop. Yeah. He yeah. sounded just like my son. He didn't want to believe, and he adored this book when he was younger, and he loved the ending because Sarah. His, the sister in the book mm -hmm. doesn't hear the sound of the bell, and his sister's name is Sarah, and he used to tease her about it, that she couldn't hear the sound of the bell. Because for him, he, he didn't want to stop believing, so he probably believed a lot longer. Of course, yeah, we, yeah. we encourage that by telling all the stories. But this book was, was part of his love of Christmas. Well, that's great. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, that's, that's sort of the, uh, the subtext, or the, sure. you know, what you might say is the theme, the the action of the story itself was a result of uh, um, just sort of daydreaming and, and, and seeing an image of a train. Uh, uh, actually, the first time I imagined this train uh, was standing still, not outside my house, but in a kind of a forest, mm -hmm. and it was winter. And uh, that was all I saw. It was just a um, an image. It was nothing right. more than that. but. Uh, as I thought about it a little more, I, I imagined that this train was waiting for me. It mm. was going to take me somewhere. And then I imagined that I, I could approach the train. I was, and I was approaching the train. Yeah. But I was only dressed in a bathrobe and pajamas. Yeah. And my slippered feet was on uh, hard snow. Oh, yeah. you know? So all of these things I'm just sort of imagining. And, and then I imagined the... Um, the opportunity to get on the train, and the train would take me anywhere I wanted to go. So at that point, the story wasn't really about Christmas, Christmas yeah. or about believing or not believing. It was just a kind of a, uh, a magic carpet story. Yeah. So I got on the train, 
and it would take me wherever I wanted to go. So there was a conductor. It was a conductor that would you could tell that you know they tell you where. Well, where as I started go. thinking about yeah. it, and I said, well, where would I like to go? Yeah. Uh, and then I thought, well, if it's winter, maybe it's December. Oh, yeah. maybe it's like kind of later in December. Right. Oh, maybe it's December 24th. Right. Where would I want to go on December 24th if there was a train waiting to take me anywhere? And I said, yeah. gee, it'd be great to go north yeah. as far yeah. as I could. Yeah. You know, the, I think the, the book, and I, I know I read something a little bit about this. You grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Right. And your grandfather had a creamery, and you lived yeah. next in an old farmhouse or something near the creamery, yeah? That's all true. And the, then you moved a few times, but then you lived in a brick home. Yeah. And it's sort of like the house that you see in Polar Express. Is that, was that based a little bit on where you grew up and, and some of those experiences? Oh, uh, a absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I was drawing on feelings that I had as a child, so the natural setting for it was the setting that I remembered from my childhood. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the house isn't clearly depicted in the book, but uh, when they made the film, they actually visited, they visited my street. Oh, really? Yes, oh, geez. and so they yeah. were uh, using that for inspiration. Okay, and, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, so the, yeah, the, the environment in which the story is depicted in the film and to a lesser degree in the book that's the kind of house I grew up in, and yeah. uh, those are the kind of pajamas I wore. You know, the, the new edition is absolutely beautiful, the cover. What did you do to change the image? Because on the original, of course, it has sort of the white border, and it, it looks different. So, And I know this also, this edition, comes with that beautiful gold, gold ornament, but also a new recording by Liam Neeson, because the original was William, William Hurt. Hurt. Yeah. Actually, I think there, yeah. there have been three William Hurt. Uh, there was one... Um, I think Garrison Keillor uh, oh, I didn't did know that. it once. Okay. But right. uh, yes, this is Liam Neeson. I think this is I think this is maybe a few years old, but it's being more kind of like uh, uh, prominently promoted sure, sure. now yeah. with this uh, anniversary uh, edition. Mm -hmm. And there is a little ornament in there. Yeah. Uh, the pictures uh, were originally done in kind of a traditional way, where a picture is printed on a page and there's a white border around it like matting a picture right. and yeah. it gives the pictures kind of a preciousness but it also by necessity makes them smaller because sure. the book can only be so big so in this new uh, edition we decided to what they call bleed the pictures which means you take the frame off so all the images are about 10 percent larger, larger. Right. and um, it doesn't seem like much, 10, 15 percent larger, but uh, when you open the book, it really has a, mm -hmm. a kind of a presence that the older editions don't have. So right. yeah. it's an yeah. improvement, I think. No, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So tell us a little about your journey, you know, growing up in Grand Rapids and you went to East Grand Rapids High School yes, yes. and then ended up at the University of Michigan. Yes. But I think there's a, an interesting story of how you ended up there well, and, yeah. and how, how you ended up majoring in, in sculpture sculpting and, and sculpture when you were there. So tell us a little bit of that because it's something about a recruiter that came to your high school. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I've told the story a number of times yeah. and, and, and um, I think at least part of the, part of the motivation for telling it is, is how, um, uh, how kind of serendipitous, mm -hmm. uh, how um, uh, the strange directions our lives can take sure. as a result of sometimes impulsive decisions, mm -hmm. things that aren't planned. Um, so in this case, I, um, I didn't study art in high school, wasn't much interested in it. Um, but when I was uh, uh, the end of my senior year, uh, an admissions officer mm -hmm. from the University of Michigan came to my high school. And um, it was possible then, it was a very low stress way of applying to college, it was possible to have a, a sit down conversation with this admissions person. They would have your transcript, right. they would have, inter in, in, they would interview you, and at the end of that conversation they would say, welcome to the University of Michigan, you know, which is great. They yeah. don't, that doesn't happen like that anymore. No, right, right. Yep. But so I uh, had that meeting, that interview, that conversation, and, and um, wasn't sure what I wanted to study at the school, and, and the admissions person was encouraging me to at least reflect on you know, this ad admissions form which had engineering and, and language and, and lots of other things. And and because I'd taken a fair amount of science courses and STEM courses in, in high school. and But 
but I didn't see anything on there, and, 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 and so I asked him, could I see the, the sheet again? And he handed it back, and so I saw there was one school that was identified as um, uh, the College of A&D. And I asked, what's, what's that? And he said, well, that's architecture and design. And um, for some reason, I, I just thought, terrific. I could get a college degree making art. Of course, I hadn't made art since third grade, which was <laughs> finger paints and stuff like that. But I thought, great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Count, count me in. Uh, <laughs> very impulsive decision. Yeah. And uh, so I said, well, that sounds interesting. You know, studying art, becoming an artist. And he said, well, um, yes, it could be, except, Chris, I see on your transcript you've, uh, you haven't taken any art in high school. Uh, so I, I, I told him that I studied privately on the weekends right. and uh, <laughs> okay. had, a, had a little studio out in my front porch where I carved marble and stuff like that. Yeah, right, right. So uh, he bought it and right. uh, he, he uh, let me into the University of Michigan. And then something you said about Norman Rockwell, well, which was... That was <laughs> He yeah, asked me he, a, a, yeah. after I after I'd persuaded him yeah. that I actually did make art that mm -hmm. I was that I did uh, right. have an interest in it. Uh, you know, not uh, you know, I mean, I wasn't being uh, completely dishonest, but <laughs> you know, I told him a, a, a pretty big story. Um, he wanted still to uh, sort of um, try to discover what my my artistic sensibilities were maybe as a final test so he sure. asked me uh, he asked me if I uh, what I thought of Norman Rockwell and I knew that um, I wasn't completely naive and, and odd but I knew that that this was 1967 there were you know different schools of thought about sure. Norman Rockwell sure. one was a, a, a group of ardent admirers who who really loved his work mm -hmm. and another was a group of people who thought he was a sentimentalist who's kind of a glorified uh, greeting card illustrator, right, you know. Right. And um, uh, so I had to try to figure out oh, something. What, what did I think of Norman Rockwell? Did I, <laughs> right. think, did I think he was this or did I think he was this? And, and so I thought about it for a little while and I, I sized the man up, you know, yeah. he was in his mid-forties in a crew cut and, and he worked for the University of Michigan and, and um, I figured he was probably on um, this size. So I mm -hmm. told him, I said, I know that some people uh, um, have criticized Rockwell for being a sentimentalist and, and um, pandering to, you know, uh, not the sort of, uh, uh, you know, the, the best sort of instincts people might have or responses to art, and, and, and that he was actually, in fact, a, a great chronicler, a great chronicler uh, of America, that he had uh, a way of telling a story in a single image that would be the envy of, of every filmmaker, that he was truly a, a gifted uh, individual. And, and when I was done with my little defense of Norman Rockwell, um, he uh, slammed his fist on the desk and he said, you're right. And uh, wow. so I answered the I, I, You answered, I, the, you I answered the question right. But he, answered, but see, I was, I, when I was in junior high school, I was, I was, uh, I was a debater. So it didn't really matter. Whether it was, uh, a debater has to be able to argue sure. effectively pro or con. Either side. Yeah, yeah. so I, 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 I took the, the, the pro side for Norman Rockwell, argued it, and turned out I was actually preaching to the choir. Yeah, wow, wow. That's <laughs> such a great story. Um, you know, you have a, a Caldecott honor, two Caldecott, so many honors, and, and 19 books out there. You know, I always wonder, when you sit down to do a book, what comes first? Is the image in your head first, or do the words... Or is it so, sort of a combination of the both? Probably a little bit more uh, uh, s seeing a kind of image, having a feeling about a kind of a story. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're both kind of vague and sort of amorphous. They, they require, uh, you know, reflection and concentration and, and, and uh, an absence of distraction to sort of, you know, congeal into something more than that. But, but often it's images that have been the... Uh, the kind of inspiration for for a story, yeah. and um, and the stories kind of reveal themselves. You know, just ask a question, answer it, right. and then a ask another one, right. answer it, and yeah. uh, and, and and I've um, described storytelling uh, often as as not so much uh, building something and and, and trying to. Um, create, construct something, mm -hmm. and sometimes it feels more like discovery, like the story was already there, right. oh, you know, yeah. because you, you have this idea, but 
one thing seems to sort of naturally lead to another. Mm -hmm. So, so majoring in sculpture at the University of Michigan, and then you got your master's at, at um, Rhode Island School of Design. So you're, you're working in this medium. When, when did putting things down on paper and, and, and doing illustration, how did that start? I mean, because you were working in something completely different. Yeah, I did uh, get my graduate degree in sculpture and, and, and actually had uh, um, uh, developed a relationship with a, a, a bona fide uptown New York City art gallery that was showing my work and, and um, uh, things were looking really good. My, the gallery owner was very supportive of, of my efforts as a sculptor. Um, and I, I, I moved into a studio uh, uh, that was very, that was, it was an excellent space, but it had uh, a drawback. The landlord uh, would turn off the heat at five o'clock in the afternoon. So you get, you know, you get about 45 minutes, but very slowly the temperature oh, would sure. drop. And, right, right. and it was not possible to work at night anymore. And, and when I was young and filled with energy back then, I, I did a lot of work in the evening. Mm -hmm. and, but suddenly, I, I was not possible to. You can't, you can't sculpt wearing right. mittens. Um, right. 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 So uh, I needed a hobby, and uh, I thought maybe if, uh, my hobby could be make, drawing pictures because mm -hmm. yeah. I hadn't hadn't done it much in, in college because I was a sculpture major right. and I was drawing pictures, but they were pictures of the sculptures I would make. Yeah. I yeah. wasn't drawing pictures in the sense we think of them in, in illustration. Sure, sure, um, sure. So I, I, I had that as a, uh, um, a hobby, and I was drawing these pictures, and, and after I'd drawn a number of them, um, I was encouraged by some people to, uh, to um, actually show those to a publisher right. in, in Boston and in New York, right. and, and um, much to my surprise, because they were black and white and done in a style um, the things that I saw then, my wife was uh, actually used uh, picture books to teach elementary art. Mm -hmm. So she was bringing right. books home for me to look at. Uh. And the books that I saw were largely um, uh, very brightly colored mm -hmm. and, and, and they looked as if they were, uh, it looks as if the illustrator, looked as if the illustrator had tried to imagine how a child would illustrate the story mm -hmm. and then do it the same way. Right. Yeah. Believing, I think, that 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 was the way you would effectively communicate visually with a child to make it look like a child's sure, yeah, drawing. Right. right. So, yeah. so I saw a lot of those books that my wife brought home, and I thought, well, uh, this uh, clearly, this is a misguided uh, idea. <laughs> you know, the 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 that that I should take these, or, or the, actually, my wife had volunteered to take these to publishers, mm -hmm. and uh, um, but she did anyway. Took them and 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 got very strong response to these. You know, kind of fussy black and white pictures, right. and yeah. and um, and so, uh, you know, they sent back manuscripts for me to contemplate illustrating. I'm but, sure, but yeah. they were they were actually the kind of manuscripts that would have been better illustrated by the kinds of things, things I've already you described. That, right. You know, right. the kind of cartoony things, mm -hmm. or or you know, kind of sentimental depictions of of, you know, little bunny rabbits with mm -hmm. backpacks on and things like that. Yeah, right. And, uh, and, and I mean, no, no disrespect no, to that no, kind no, of work right. because yeah. there's an audience for it and, and, and kids are, are yeah. uh, entertained by it, but uh, I couldn't do it. And I told the publishers who uh, sent this work along that I didn't think I was cut out. Yeah. Thanks for your time. You know, yeah. uh, glad you liked my work, but I'm just going to go back and make some more right. sculpture now. Yeah. But one, one uh, editor, uh, Walter, Walter Lorraine, Lorraine. Yeah. Uh, up in Boston, Houghton Mifflin Company, was persistent. He liked the work and he said, listen, I, I believe that um, your work suggests you have an imagination that means you probably could tell a story yeah. if you wanted to, if you chose to. So, uh -huh. so with his encouragement, I started uh, working on a story which became my first book, right. The Garden of Abdul Ghazazi. Right, and that one is, and it won a Caldecott honor. For, it for did much to book. my surprise because, right. yeah. because even though even though it was encouraging for me to to uh, um, you know ha have a publisher accept the work, uh, embrace the, mm -hmm. the, the 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 story and the pictures, publish it, I still didn't believe that that uh, that meant anybody would buy it. <laughs> that anyone yeah. would be interested in right. because I, I could tell from, from the examples that I'd seen in bookstores and, and, and that my wife had show, shared with me at home that it was, a, 
it was a pretty unconventional book. Uh, the story, for one thing, is uh, very a ambiguous. It's, it's not clear what happened in the story. Uh, the last page suggests that there's a couple of different interpretations. Sure. And, and since it was a book for children, a, a picture book for children, I, I'd written a, a, a black and white book, kind of representational pictures in an older style, and it had a story in it that that uh, didn't really uh, have an ending. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so I thought, well, all those things together, you know, the the the, the likely outcome for that is is uh, you know some big stacks on remainder tables. Yeah. So. No, and that didn't happen. Which <laughs> So Walter Lorraine, you know, he was, he's sort of legendary when it comes to publishing. And, and what, what was he like? Um, because I, I've heard some things, and, and, but it's... Well, yeah. you know, it's funny. I, 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 I had a friend, David McCauley. Sure. Cathedral, yeah. castle, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, who worked very closely with Walter. Mm -hmm. And actually it was David who was one of the people who had encouraged me, uh, along with my wife, to, to take these drawings up to... Boston and and um, uh, David used to talk to me about his visits with Walter and 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 I was always surprised because they there was so much give and take and and, and yeah. David would describe bringing some stuff up and he, and Walter wasn't really sure about that and and so he'd go back and and I and I knew some other Houghton authors well enough to know that their interactions with Walter were um, were uh, quite involved and quite, uh, and um, my relationship with Walter was much more kind of, I don't know, laissez-faire. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't mean that, I don't mean to suggest that he wasn't deeply involved in my work yeah. and didn't, and didn't care greatly about the success or, or, or the, uh, uh, the realization of my artistic uh, ambition. In fact, he used to say that. He, used to, he told me that he felt his job as, a, a, as an editor and publisher was to help artists make the best thing they could. Right. You know, and, um, mm -hmm. and he was willing to make, you know, compromises uh, in, in favor of the artist rather than in, in favor of, of what others might think of as commercial interests. And, and so he was really pretty hands-off with me. I mean, I, 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 on at least a few books, I delivered finished work. Right. I, yeah. I would tell him, you know, in, in uh, November I was working on something and I, I'd maybe just describe on the phone to him what the story was and he says, sounds great. And mm -hmm. eight months later I'd show up with the, with the stuff and he'd say, looks, looks really wow. great, great. Yeah, wow. And, I mean, he'd have some, just, sure. some suggestions. Sure, of course. But some yeah. Little, yeah, little, little text, things. little copy things, yeah. but uh, for the most part, he, um, he made it easy on him. He made it easy, and he, you know, he, he was willing yeah. to, uh, you know, he was willing to publish a black and white book that had an, uh, yeah. this ambiguous ending, this first thing, and right. and he published, you know, uh, you know, the mysteries of Harris Burdick, oh, uh, the Z was uh, zapped, right. uh, you know, things that, uh, you know, kind of challenged conventional ideas but, but about that's picture why, books. That's why people love them, especially, you yeah, know, I mean, yeah. parents, children, but educators love these books for those very reasons at yeah, this stage, yeah, you know, yeah. so. No, no, I, I, yeah, um, yeah. I, uh, I, uh, I'm indebted to him for the, for the freedom he gave me because right. I, I, when, when I first started doing this, I would, I would hear stories about other people working in the field who were complaining about the, uh, like the word list they had, you know, they were working with a confined vocabulary, right. you know, and they were complaining about, you know, getting feedback from an art director that, you know, the the the, the bunny's eyes weren't big enough, you know, and and I thought, jeez, uh -huh. yeah. I that that didn't even seem like the same field I was working. Right, I, I was sure. I was I was working in a different field, you know, and it, it was largely because of the. Uh, you know, the freedom I was given. Right. Okay, so talking about, you know, movies, and, and, and there have been many examples where picture books have been made into full-length feature films, and Polar Express is one. Mm -hmm. um, so expanding the story, but also as a thorough, you know, and also Jumanji are examples of taking yeah. your your books and expanding. Did you, were you involved in that expansion of the story in order to make it into a full-length and feature film? And how did you feel about it, you know, when these movies yeah, were completed yeah. and were out in the world? In the first case, in Jumanji, uh, the studio optioned the, uh, optioned the book. And what that means is that 
they'll pay you a small amount of money. They aren't buying the film rights. They're paying an option uh, for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And what that option means is that they will try to create a script. And if at the end of the option period they like the script and they will believe it will make a good film, right. uh, then they will exercise the option and buy the film rights. Um, only my, my understanding is that only about one out of 23 or 24 option mm -hmm. properties actually get uh, turned into films. Yeah, sure. So uh, when you hear about authors that are popping the champagne corks because their book's been optioned, it's premature. Premature, for sure, for sure. <laughs> it's premature. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't pop any champagne cork because I, I, I don't believe anything good's ever going to happen. So, <laughs> so I said. Uh, yeah. So, so I sold the rights, and I said that yeah. it's never, it's not going to be a sure. movie. It'll never sure. happen. So, but they, so they, they commissioned some scripts, and they didn't like, didn't like the scripts that they got, and, and, and it appeared as if their, their guess that it might make a, a feature film, was, uh, you know, ill-founded, and right. they were ready to walk away. But I talked to the producers, and I said. Um, I think there's I think there's a story here that just hasn't you know been developed and and they said well uh, why don't you you know work on something so I wrote a treatment and oh, a treatment okay. a treatment is like a seven or eight page description of the story of a film but it doesn't have the conventional uh, slug lines for you know time place dialogue that sort of thing okay. it's just a story what happens in this movie uh -huh. so I wrote this treatment for Jumanji. Uh, you know, about this town that has this trauma because this young boy uh, who is the son of the, uh, uh, of the leading citizen of the town and, and, and how all that affects the town and, and then his return many years later because it was believed originally that he was kidnapped. The original scripts uh, didn't have any reality in them at all. They, yeah. they, they just... Uh, so I was trying to actually get some reality into it, so I wrote this treatment. And, mm -hmm. And it was well received by the studio, and 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 they actually then invited me to write a screenplay. So I wrote the screenplay for Jumanji, right. and, but I did not. After I wrote it, they liked it. They actually green lit it on the basis of that, but it was subsequently rewritten many times. Right. Uh, and that's what happens. And, right. Oh, and sure. so the thing I had written was had had more of kind of like a Twilight Zone feeling to it. It ended up being more of an action film. A disappointment to me, mm. and had been rewritten uh, so much that I didn't get a screen credit. But that wasn't a great disappointment yeah, to right. me. But um, so I, I was involved. I, I was greatly involved in kind of the story architecture sure. at the very beginning, uh, but saw it so significantly it altered, altered, altered right, uh, right. before it became a film. But even when the film was done, even though it wasn't the kind of film uh, I had imagined could be made, uh, it was still good entertainment yeah you know right. it was it was it had good performers it had a it had a good budget uh, wasn't always on board with some of the director's decisions but nonetheless mm -hmm. it was not the kind of book you see done from some children's books where they make something that's not really very ambitious in terms of filmmaking all they're doing is 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 trying to make something that has the name that all the kids will recognize that's right. they'll yeah. get all the kids in there in the first weekend make some money Hope the hope the bad word of mouth doesn't spread too quickly. Right, <laughs> like what they've done with Dr. some of Dr. Seuss's books. Yeah, yes. yeah. So they right. so, yeah. so so sure. so so I don't feel yeah. um, I didn't feel unlucky about Jumanji, and, and felt felt fortunate too that uh, the other two films, uh, the Polar Express, which I had much less involvement mm -hmm. in than mm -hmm. Jumanji, yeah. and uh, and Zathura didn't have much involvement in that. But but in all three cases, they I think they were sincere efforts to make. You know, good yeah. entertainment for family audiences, and, um, and 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 had the highest production values, and were um, you know serious efforts on the part of the studios right. to make good film entertainment. But, so yeah, but they haven't distracted us from the, the great original picture books that they've, they've come uh, from. Yeah. Oh, not, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> well, Chris, thank you so much. And, and thank you so much for coming to see us again. Oh, and you're welcome. We're so you're excited welcome. for the 30th anniversary and uh -huh. this beautiful new edition. All right. Thank Great. you. Great. What a wonderful conversation we've had with Chris Van Allsburg, one of America's greatest illustrators and authors of children's picture books. It's the 30th anniversary of the Polar Express. Thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed. Mm -hmm.